Um, having a chat to, to Andrew today, and uh, thank you very much for, for, for your time. Uh, Andrew's yeah. from CA Connect, who you know, I had a chat with, with Gareth a few weeks ago. So, so we're connecting now on a completely different, completely different topic. So if you can give us a little bit of background to your journey and your qualification and what you do at the moment before we get started on our topic today, that would be really good. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I am, um, well, as you know, I'm a, I'm a CA, but I kind of don't like the definition being a CA. I'm, I think I'm more than that. But basically, I started off, didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, ACT. Um, mm. You know, I got career advice and I got the worst career advice. Basically, said you can be whatever you want to be. Yes, yeah, so helpful. <laughs> yeah. And then I kind of thought, well, I don't know. And, and I went to UCT, initially started doing actuarial science. Okay. After, I don't know, six months of that, I was like, or a year of that, I was like, no, that's not going to That's not cool. Help. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I started studying CA as kind of like in my mind was like uh, the, the closest variable to, to being an actuary, actuary. So I didn't have to pick up any more subjects. I could just okay. keep going. Like losing <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I have no idea what uh, CA does. Right. Um, I suppose I knew that CA is on business and theory, and I knew that. Uh, good. You, it's a good career and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's nice, and your mom will be proud, type thing, you know. Fair so, enough. yeah. <laughs> be a CA. So then I started the journey of CA, and um, I, I, so I studied UCT. Um, I was a just past the bar kind of student, like 51 okay. is good enough. Okay, um, all right. So you I were felt guilty, okay. so I picked up more subjects to kind of make myself feel better. So I did a oh, few really? to try and uh, justify why I could get 51 and be okay. Because, you know, there was an expectation that I should be doing better. So I said, no, right. I'm doing more. I can do less, you know. Okay, um, that's interesting. Did, uh, interesting approach, yeah. Business science, finance, okay. CA. Um, and then kind of at the end of CA, uh, my business partner, Gareth, said to me, listen, why don't you come teach? And I thought, well, that's a good idea. Okay. We can we can earn a bit of money and I'll teach. So I, I applied to teach and UCT accepted me to teach. So I started teaching um, accounts too. And then in in uh, my first year out of article, first year after passing, I, I started articles. And during my articles, I did my uh, well, I did it in teaching accounting. Um, okay. Which was just because I happened to do accounting and background. I'm not a really big fan of accounting the subject. Um, right. Currently, I do management, accounting, and finance, so I'm more the business side of things. And then uh, I, so from there, I, 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 I did actually articles, studied um, my master's in financial management, so I did that, so I've got my master's in financial management now. Okay. And then from there, out of articles, I kind of thought, it's now or never, you know, this is the time to start a business. You don't, you know, there are very few CAs who get to 40 and, and say, now is the time to start a business. If you go yeah. down that path, you get yeah. stuck in life, and, you know, so I kind of thought, now or never. Yeah, I'm going to be an entrepreneur now. So we brainstormed a bit and obviously I had experience in education. So I thought, well, mm. let's start a business in education. That's how we started CA Connect. Four right. of us got together and had this brainstorm that students needed help. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in that logic, we built the business and that's kind of the 10, now 11 year journey that we've been wow. on. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So that's how I've got to where I am now, I suppose. There's a, a story between when we started CA Connect and where we are now, but yeah. um, other than that, that's my oh. background. We'll cover that another day. <laughs> so, long story. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons, or the main reason, that we were the topic, or the theme that we want to that we want to cover today. Um, I think there's probably quite a few students going, "Oh, great! You study financial management. Can you save me?" Because <laughs> yeah. we know how <laughs> we know how that goes. Um, but we're not covering we're not covering how to save your ass from financial management today. So what, what, what we wanted to talk about is a topic and a theme that's coming up quite a lot from, from a lot of my students and a lot of people that I deal with, which is what is happening with the future of the accounting profession? Um, is it worth studying accounting because you know, artificial intelligence is coming and we're all going to lose our jobs? And you know, there's, there's a lot of, I have a lot of uh, guys that are, are, are starting studying or, or looking at studying and saying, they people are telling me that I shouldn't study to be an accountant because there won't be any jobs. And um, how does this change our studying, etc.? So the topic we kind of want to talk about is a little bit of a futuristic, you know, futuristic thing, as well as 
And I think basically the starting point is what does this mean to someone who's going to start studying accounting or is busy studying accounting or is even potentially finishing off studying accounting? What does this mean in their lives a little bit more practically? So that's the discussion. That's the theme that we, you know, we want to cover. We want to cover today. Um, and look, should we start off with the with the sort of the entry level? Someone in matric, someone in first year studying accounting. Uh, would you say that they should stop studying accounting and go study something else because accountants are going to be obsolete in the next couple of years? How would you How would you answer that question? Based on what? Well, I think. The premise to that is that, and I, which I don't agree with, is that this idea that um, you're, there's one type of CA, there's one type of doctor, there's one type of engineer. And I think right. when people make decisions around their career and what they want to be, they should understand who they are first. And I think, you know, when you get, you get a CA that can be in corporate being a strategic leader, you can get a CA who's a financial analyst that likes maybe some of the detail and the numbers yeah. and the research. Yeah. You get CAs that are cost accountants. You get yeah. CAs that you know, do financial management. So there, there, there are there are so many versions of, of of what a CA is. In the same way, you get doctors that Absolutely. want okay. to be at the side and helping patients. You get yeah. the doctors that want to be the specialist surgeons. They don't yeah. even deal with them. Okay. Yeah. So I think what's more important for a student in terms of deciding what they want to do is to know who they are and how the, their education is going to fulfill their needs. Um, so that would be my first question. So wh- wh- who are you? Are you are you inherently relational? Um, in which case, there are layers of what the CA does that might be dangerous, um, but you can always reshape that to something right. that you that you need. Like, like I can speak to a friend of mine who's a partner in an audit firm, and, and he'll he spends his time you know, selling essentially and, and yes, developing yes, relationships and, yep. and using his very strong relational skills yep. to be an effective CA. But he's a bit abstracted from the technical detail, and he doesn't yeah. worry about some of that stuff and the accounts and the numbers, etc., because he's good at what he's doing and he's found yep. a role that meets his personality so my so inherently the question that follows that is then what are we trying to get from the ca education Mm. and is it still valuable and and because of what you could still be and i think Mm. um it's important as to how it it really comes down to how you how you learn and and i suppose the type of institutions that you go to and choose because for me you get a whole lot of different ways of studying um at the end of the day the goal has to be figuring out how to navigate overwhelming information in a world of overwhelming information True. right that's got yeah. to be the goal so the skill yeah. is to develop the ability to make good decisions and to use um what you study to help you but not in a way where you've maybe learned procedurally what a ca does right. so when you ask the question what's going to happen with ai and the future of cas yeah there's a whole section of what a ca is that's going to fall away yes. it will definitely prejudice a whole bunch of CAs that have found roles in the systematic way of yep. being a CA, yep. you know, and yeah, yeah. those things are definitely going to be under pressure, yeah. but that doesn't mean that the other layers of what a CA is, which is the human layers, um, yeah. strategic leadership, you know, management. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that we do as, as um, sort of robust CAs that require skills that are definitely not procedural and, and can complement and enhance using AI and technology. I mean, if you look right. at our business now, we're using technology to support enhancing the skill of the human caliber that we have right so my yeah. answer to a student would be to, i wouldn't be worried about what ai is going to do to that career if, if that's your fear then any career where you are depending on the certification as being your solution it yeah, means you're right. depending on not yourself and your skills you're depending on a role and then yeah. you're depending on a defined role that defined role can very easily be taken over by a machine yeah. What you've got to depend on is your ability to adapt and think and, yeah. and that's what you've got to get from the CA education. So then the question that follows that is, are CA educations creating that? Yeah. And that I, I can't categorically say in every environment. I think yeah. some environments, yes, definitely there's a time and energy spent fostering thinking. In other environments, Not it's just systematic. I've got to pass. And then at the end of it, all you can do is what you've systematically what you, done. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so before we get into the, you know, the, the specific education, because I yeah. totally, totally agree with you on that. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. And what I like coming from your conversation is the focus on your personality, your relational dynamic, and um, your... People still kind of call it soft skills, although... It's really hard and they're not soft. <laughs> they're professional skills. Um, and your ability to adapt. You know, so for me, innovate for me it's, and adapt. It's, 
it's understanding you. Yeah. Understanding that you are unique, right? That you are not going to be like every other CA. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's understanding it's understanding how you can use who you are and find roles that play to those strengths. Yes. Right? Yeah. And 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 for me, critical skills are being able to adapt and reinvent yourself. Totally. Lifelong learning in the sense that I'm always curious, yeah. and I'm always yeah. asking questions, and I'm always challenging the status quo. Those yeah. things are fun, fundamental skills. Now you don't have to be a CA to get those skills. No. Those are skills uh, you can get in a lot of other careers. Yeah. Um, what's quite nice about CA though, as as in the learning of CA, which I've valued, is there's positives and negatives. The, the, mm. the positive side of it is that it's the language of business, <laughs> it's the context of business, and actually, at, at the end of the day, all activity connects to a business. It's about making money yeah. and yeah. professional, you know, so even if you're a doctor, you have to run a business at some point. You have to be involved yeah. in a business as an employee and understand. So at some point, but doing CAs, you're, you're getting a nice broad skill set that touches into all the domains yeah. because you can connect into a medical environment because you can be involved in yeah. running a, a hospital because you have the skills to do that. Yeah. You can do the same in the engineering world. You, you won't ever be the engineer building no, no, a no, no. doctor. But you, but the it's part that, of it's part of the yeah. team. Yeah. So for me, that's quite nice because especially if you're not dead set, like I know I want to be an engineer, I want to build right. bridges. Yeah. Right. Then it's quite a nice way of being broader right. than being narrow, yeah. um, which gives you flexibility in terms of your life going forward. That that yeah. that I like that's, a lot about it, and I've used that true. to a large extent in my life because I I'm not a classic CA. Yeah. In retrospect, I should have probably done something like engineering, and I might have found been more enjoyable. But I'm using CA in a way that that allows me to be in find enjoyment in a lot of the different domains that I'm involved in. Yeah. Yeah. The downside to CA is that, and I think this is a bit more esoteric, but it, it because it's very monetary focused, mm. you, you define yourself around money very quickly. Mm. Like if you think about it, an architect builds a house, an engineer builds a bridge, a doctor heals people, those actions and activities, the money's a secondary thing. Right. I, my, my goal, I mean, if you ask a, a doctor, what is the best thing he's ever done? He's not going to say, I made a lot of money. He's going to say, I helped this yeah. person. Oh, I happen to make a lot of money, but I'm yeah. helping these people. If you ask yeah. um, an engineer, they'll talk about the bridges they've built and the things they've designed. They're not going to talk about the money they've made. And they'll be like, oh, cool. I also make yeah. money. Right. Ask an accountant. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, what have you done? Oh, well, uh, I've made a lot of money. And they, don't, they can't talk about the, yeah, the value. Yeah, yeah. It's self-evident in terms of what they do. Yeah. And what's your level of meaning? Mm. That's, the I think that's very of, true. I think part of, part of the challenge I find where, you know, the, when I talk to students, part of the challenge I think is accounting is one of those fields that are so heavily stereotyped for so many years, you know, accountants, gray suit, love numbers, OCD, uh, very boring, no personality, uh, you know, can only do one thing, not a people person, all of this rubbish. And, and to, to a large extent, you know, a lot of students that I've spoken to kind of feel as though they should tick that box because if I don't tick those boxes, if I'm not boring, if I, if I, you know, if I'm not detail oriented, if I don't like numbers or whatever, then I'm never going to be a good CA. Like I'm never yeah. going to be an accountant. So for me, I feel it's almost like a, a chicken and egg thing. I think, you know, students, students kind of go, I want to be, I want to meet all these criteria because that's what I believe you have to be in order to mm. be an accountant. And I think it's going to take, it takes a, it's going to take some time and a lot more work and a lot more exposure uh, to, to get people to realize that the most, you know, you're going to be far more successful if you're innovative, a people mm. person, you know, able to adapt and you look for meaning in, in your career and in your relationships, etc. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, because you're hundred percent right. You know, what, one of the things when students ask me, yeah, but you know, why are, for example, why are exams focusing more on discussions than calculations, for example, and um, kind of like, why am I going to pay you, you know, a thousand rand an hour to, to do an amortization calculation when I can, I, I can so. Google that, you know, uh, yeah. there's an Excel spreadsheet on the template where I just have to plug in three numbers and it's going to pop up for me. Like, why am I going to get you to do that? Or, yeah, and I just, I think we don't, you know, most of my students don't naturally think about it until it's brought to their attention and they go, yeah, okay, good point. So where is my value? You know, what, what am I going to do? And, but what is interesting, yeah. what, what was very interesting is this, this distinction between CASA, so the South African CA framework, yes. and CAs globally, right? right? And, and I, I, I'm at risk of generalizing, but to a large degree, the uh -huh. SA has defined itself in a very unique way yep. relative to most other CAs. So the global stereotype of CAs are little men in gray suits 
is yes. far more applicable in the broader sense of the global economy than in South Africa, where CAs have become the MBAs yeah, of South Africa. Right. And I yeah. think to understand what a CA is in South Africa, you've got to understand that it really reflects a different way of being doing an MBA um, and, yeah. and trying to get skills that are far broader and far less specialized. Yeah. That's the South African CA. And mm-hmm. if you look at what Saka defines as the CA, they're talking about the leaders. We don't want to be leaders of the yeah. next era. And, you know, this idea of being a leader is disconnected from being the support person that provides the financial information to the leader. Yeah. And the typical CA actually is bucketed and boxed in the support role the that's providing yeah. the information that's necessary yeah. Yeah, versus yeah. the one that's innovating and changing the lead yeah. and, and getting people to, you know, be inspired behind them, which is the true leadership. Thing. Yeah. And I think it's quite exciting for what CAs have become in South Africa. And that's why globally we are very highly regarded because we right. aren't the classic thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an important distinction. You know, I wouldn't make that distinction if I was a CA in another country necessarily. So, that kind of leads us to, to the next question, which is, or the next discussion point, which is, so the profession, as most professions are, are evolving, are transitioning, are going to change, are already changing, fine. Do you feel, and let's focus on the South African CA at the moment, because that's where, you know, that's what most of the people I talk to and most of our students and stuff are doing, fine. Let's focus on that for the moment. Um, and the, the competency framework that comes down from the profession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we're saying that we're cultivating the next generation of leaders, of strategic thinkers, business leaders, MBAs, whatever you want to call it, do you feel that the competency frameworks and the syllabus and the stuff that the guys are learning on the ground at the moment is catering towards that shift? Yes and no. I think... You know, there's the, well, firstly, I think there's a recognition with Saika um, around what we need to change to right. keep innovating. And I think there's definitely a difficulty in the South African context with the existing university structures to motivate and encourage everyone to change and to lead and to, and to be coerced into driving the change yeah. necessary. But there's a very strong awareness of the need to change yeah. in Saika. So this is not a blind spot, yeah. but it's... It's a hard thing to do given the rate of change in the background and the difficulty to move these institutions to follow. Yeah. Yeah. So on the one hand, I think we are behind where I would like to be. Um, yeah. With Saka, they'd say to me, listen, you don't understand how much we've done. Here's the realism. Here's the logistics. So, Here's the challenges. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I, I do think we are moving. Um, I wouldn't want to shoot Saka in the foot and say, I don't think they're doing enough. I, I think they are doing their best. Yeah. Um, is it enough? I don't know. And I think, but what I will say is that fortuitously in a way, and if we talk about the brand CA, not necessarily the individual students, because not everyone's necessarily getting the right education, but the brand CA um, is attracting some of the best talents in the country. Mm. And so whether it's explicitly or implicitly, those skills are being instilled in brand CA consistently Mm. because the brightest people are being attracted to be CAs in South Africa. And then they go out and they lead and therefore they instill the frameworks in terms of what we expect from CAs and, and they teach and lead in those yeah. contexts. Yeah. Um, but is the educational system, i.e. training to be a CA, directly developing those skills? Not as much as it should. Mm. The needle's shifting and there's a recognition. Mm. And as that needle shifts and the recognition shifts slowly, you know, I think it will. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is not trying to chase a goal that's now ever, forever shifting. It's shifting ourselves from a technical program mm. to a conceptual program. Mm. And that's why what answers your question about why do they ask all these conceptual questions is because you're trying mm. to shift everyone, not worrying about the detail mm. and not worrying about why six times six equals, you know, 36 when what we actually care about is what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I often talk, I often say to my class essentially is I say that there are four stages to problem solving. And if you understand this, you understand what we're trying to do with CA. The first is identifying the problem. You, you've got to be able to identify yeah, the problem. Right. The second is modeling the problem. Taking this, this problem in the real world and turning it into some sort of assumption-driven model that we can use to make good decisions from. Okay, that's a skill. Yeah. Right? That's not yeah. A, a computer cannot do that. Yeah. A human can do that because they can understand how to rationalize, how to make assumptions appropriately, et cetera, for the context. The next step is solving the model, which is you know, putting it in Excel and getting an answer. And the third step is interpreting what that means, the right. answer means. Okay? Yeah. Now, historically, going back 100 years, the hardest part was always solving because right. that was a challenge. You didn't have computers. You didn't have those techniques. So you had to 
trust that there was serious clerical accuracy in your ability to solve. Right. And so there was a huge focus in education, maths education, schooling education, <laughs> on the idea of solving. Yeah, yeah. Now the problem is that solving has become irrelevant, right? We've got computers. Absolutely. I, mean, I think the last time I actually tried to work something on paper was years ago, right? <laughs> If you didn't ask me a query and I'll work on Excel. I don't bother trying to do it on a piece of paper. No, of course not. No. Okay? So, so now we're saying, wait a minute, but where is the value coming from, from no, this yeah. day or the, the student going forward? Yeah. It's from those other layers. And so what's happening is there's a shifting away in the assessments from the technical right. detail yeah. of solving right. to the interpretation of the problem and the interpretation of the, well, identifying the problem yeah. and interpretation of the, the yeah. answer. 100%. 100%. You know? um, and I think, you know, that's, that's a, it's a natural lead in to, or a natural connection, if you will, to students' worst nightmares, which are the discussion question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the interpretation by nature requires an explanation of what this means, a discussion, yes. a debate, yeah, and exactly. advice, and you know, impact, whatever the case is. And that by nature is you have to communicate with someone. I've taken the numbers on this is what it means. Because, you know, it's, um, it's so easy for, you know, students go, I want the numbers, I want the formats, I want the formulae, I want the, you know, that's what, I, you know, that's what I'm used to. And I, I agree with you. I think, you know, we're, we need to move from a system or thought process of learning to remember. Um, I kind of talk about it as using your brain as a filing cabinet or a toolbox. And let's be honest, historically, the yeah, way that most of us have learned is like, okay, that's interesting, put it in the filing cabinet. Okay, that's interesting. And in reality, most CAs by nature have a fairly good filing cabinet and a fairly good categorization. So we can pick it out, you know, retain it and use it fairly easily. But when you give us a toolbox and go, here's a bunch of tools, like you say, identify the problem, assess the problem, and now use the tools that you've got to solve any kind of problem. Uh, we're like, Okay, where's the format? You know, where, yeah. <laughs> where's the where's the and, template? And where's the, going I back to your first before. question, those people will be obsolete because you're trying to be right. a bad computer. Right, <laughs> that's such a good way of putting it because I can get a computer to do that, and that's going to be so much more accurate yeah. than you. <laughs> that's so true, a bad computer. I like that. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Again, one of the things are. Um, you know, as a silly example I use for, for my students, you know, that are a little bit lower in, in the study levels so they don't necessarily get the conceptual stuff is, you know, when, when I talk to people whose parents were accountants, you know, or grandparents were, were accountants and stuff, they talk about the fact that the skills that were really valued and, and they, like their dad or granddad's party trick was the ability to add up two columns of figures at the same time. You know, in, in the manual, the, you know, those big fat ledgers with like, 10,000 columns. And they were able to add two or three columns, you know, together, yeah, yeah. like separately at the same time, simultaneously. And that was like, wow, you're a great accountant. You know, that's yeah. amazing. Now your ability to do that is like fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> like you <laughs> spend time like, figuring out how to do that. You spend time, like who cares? Nobody's going to pay you for that. So that's an, exactly the same. It's an example of a skill that was highly valued. Technology shifted. And here we are where it's like cool party trick, dude. But, you know, unless you're going to go stand on a street corner and do it for entertainment, nobody cares, like nobody's interested. Um, so I think, I think that's very true. And, and what I like, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's easy to say the profession should change, my university should change, my textbook should change, whatever the case is. But I think the starting point is that you need to change. You, yeah, you well, need think, to think about the I, way I, you learn and what you're learning for. Yeah, for sure. Point. But the the challenge with that is that takes a, a level of personal maturity that mm -hmm. not every student necessarily has, is to be able to reflect and recognize what they need. So I yeah. do think it's a shared responsibility that the institutions okay. that they go to need to be able to probe and prime the right questions to get these people yeah. to understand what the mature decision is. Yeah. I can't, I can't change the way you think, but yeah. I can probe you to think about it so that you can change the way you think. Right. Yeah. And if, if nothing happens, nothing's going to challenge you to change the way you think. Yeah. And I'll take it a step further and say, in actual fact, if you look at our socioeconomic situation, mm -hmm. as uh, you know, you've got a lot of previously disadvantaged students coming into the system. They come from environments where, and, and, and South Africa just generally is very economically strained, which means there's a, there's a, base level fear embedded in our psyche yes. that says I need to be secure. Okay. Yeah. And if you think about it, why am I being CA? Well, if you really ask 99% of CAs, I'm a CA because I want to be secure. 
because I want to make enough money to yeah. be secure. Now that I don't, I don't see that as wrong. It's a natural yeah. response to where you're at. Now, if you are specifically previously disadvantaged, that's even more important. Absolutely. Because then the story is, I want to be secure because I also have to look after my mom. I have to look right. after my cousins. I have to look, yeah. So yeah. for those people, it's like I am the hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then, what happens is the the weight of pressure sits on these people when they go through the educational process. This this starts from schooling, mm. and immediately. You know, if you don't have a bigger picture of education, which I'm blessed to have, you 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 look at your success as a defined by your marks, mm. as opposed to the journey, mm. and you go, "Hell, I need to get good marks." That becomes yeah. the national narrative. I am doing well at school, and I will be successful if I get good marks. Yeah. What's the easiest way to get good marks if you don't understand something? You can either take the time, step yeah. back, try to learn and process the the bigger conceptual understanding, so that it becomes easy and you get the right learning, or you can rote learn to get the answer. And if it. educators are lazy in the way they assess, there are a lot of tricks to get to the right answer, which means suddenly the game is, all we're trying to do is get right answers. And then we go, well done. And you're getting good marks, 90s and stuff. And you go, yeah. I think I must be brilliant. You yeah. go through this whole journey and you've, you've not done no, no real learning. Mm. You've just done filing. Mm. But, but I'll say one more thing and then you can shut me up because I do talk a lot. <laughs> but that is, that is this, oh. is that, is that think about your sense of identity. Yeah. If when you learn, you start off and you just look at a bit of information, a concept, an idea, and you go, I don't understand this, mm. chuck it in. Why? Because more is important because I don't know what is right or what is wrong, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. So I just throw it in. So then the goal becomes, grab, let's put as much information as I can in my head. The problem is that you might be able to file it somewhat, but to a large degree, it becomes a jumble of disconnected ideas that don't fit together. Right. right? Yeah. The truth of the world is that all these ideas connect. They make sense. There's a relationship between all these ideas. If you take the time and you protect your thinking so that you only put stuff that connects in, mm. what's in there is a series of robust connections that self-support each other. Mm. Now suddenly something new comes and it's like, I don't know. I don't know how it fits. Now your bias is, I'm not damaging this until I know how it fits. A little bit. Yeah. I'll discard it. Yeah. Right? Whereas the person that doesn't trust his little bit in his head goes, throw that in. It's another mm -hmm. thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Extrapolate that forward over a 15-year life. And what you've got is two different personalities. You've got personality A, who does not trust his understanding of the world, does not trust himself, feels inauthentic about who they are as a person because they feel like they've passed, but they're a liar because they really don't know the truth. Yeah. Okay? So then they sit there and they go, I don't know. What do you think? So they become very deferral in their response yeah. and they'd rather have safeguards around them to protect them because they don't want to take any risks because they don't want to be shown up. Okay. Yeah. The other type of person goes, I know exactly. I don't want to take the information. I challenge, I probe, I ask for responses. I crit you, not in an unhealthy way, but I have the sense of identity in my thinking to be able to say, no, that doesn't fit. Please give me more information and, and we'll just, and maybe, you and I will joust, and at the end, I'm like, oh, oh, now I see how it fits, and I put right. it in. Yeah, yeah. So I go, no, nah, not fitting. We can agree yeah. to disagree. That's not damaging myself. We move on. But either way, my yeah. stance in life is far more, I'm okay, I can do this. Yeah. Two different people, two different career paths, two different success stories in their lives, right? It all comes down to this. This is like the defining difference in pose in your life that will determine everything. Yeah. So for me, this thing of conceptual thinking not only is more necessary because AI is going to destroy those types of jobs going forward, which is a very simplistic way. Yeah. It's also necessary to buy you the freedom and the sense of identity that you want and you long for. Yeah. Yeah. You see how it's much bigger and then everything fits. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, to, to some extent you can sort of see, okay, that's a bit of a nice to have, you know, dude, that's fantastic. Once I'm qualified, because you, you kind of yeah. hear that a lot, you know, once I'm qualified, I'll work on that stuff. Because, you know, at the moment, <laughs> at the moment, I just want to, you know, I just want the piece of paper and then, you know, I'll work on all the warm fuzzy stuff, you know, that's cool and everything. But the, the reality is it's becoming imperative, you know, that you... Well, uh, let me, let me, let me, you, let me yeah. frame it a bit differently. The reality is it's becoming imperative because A, those jobs are becoming less valuable. But let me, right. let me give the picture of what, what your life will be. Okay? Yeah. I don't trust myself. I get put in a role. I'm a CA. I pat myself on the back. I've just become a CA. What does that mean? I get paid a lot of money for very average work. Mm. I get put in a role. They put safeguards around me, checks and balances, because that's how 
companies manage the risk of staff they don't trust they aren't putting in high level positions so you're now in a role where you do the same thing Mm. for the rest of your life Mm. okay you hate your job because you never found fulfillment or meaning it never was there in the first place you just got your tick you can't leave because you're earning more money than any other job will pay you okay you've got your car your house and all those things but you feel desperate in the fulfillment of your life Right. Right. So now that becomes that becomes what you buy. Rather be the hairdresser that gets meaning than the CA earning more money stuck in a place that they hate for the rest of their life. And yeah. that's what happens to a significant number of CAs that don't develop these skills. So yeah. it's more important than you're not going to have a job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, the next layer is that when you don't have a job, you're not going to lose a job straight away. But what you're going to find is that there's pressure on your productivity. Yeah. You have to work more hours because yeah. otherwise the computer is going to do it. There's pressure on your price. We're not giving you increases anymore because we can do it to the computer otherwise. In other words, we are competing away your value and you're stuck. Yeah. yeah. Do that over 25 years and you're desperate. You end up. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very interesting point. So um, if you had to, if, if you had to add one subject or one genre concept subject to the current ca syllabus not you know forgetting logistics and forgetting um you know the the reasonableness or the realism but if you had to add one subject you know one conceptual topic or one conceptual subject to the current ca syllabus that you think is you know massive gap and that you'd love students to have exposure to uh what what would that be a little bit off the wall. <laughs> I, I feel like... Like what um, skill do you, would you love them to have a subject for kind of thing? So I, I can, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it, but I'll say this. I don't think the building blocks are missing. It's yeah. the how of the building blocks that are missing, not the fact that they're there. So um, given the context is CA, given the context is business leadership, yeah. right? given what we want you to be capable of doing and thinking in the frameworks we want you to use when you leave, I think there's enough in it. Okay. I think I would cut stuff out that I think Agreed. is not color, yeah. Yeah. enough color Agreed. to justify the effort and energy Agreed. to do it. You know? And yeah. there's a lot of stuff that I would cut, but that's, yeah. that's you'll be amazing. voted in for president based on that thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every CA student in the country would vote you for president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe I should go for that. You know yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's worth it. <laughs> We've seen worse. In right? terms of um, the how, I think the most fundamental subject, and I am biased because I am a management accountant yeah. finance person. You're allowed. But the, the fundamental subject is so I frame management accounting and finance as this process of decision making. Mm. essentially decision making and learning how to assert decision making or ensure you influence decision making onto the people that you manage right that's what it amounts whether decisions are operational in the detail or whether they macro in the bigger picture i'm buying a company yeah. you've got to make decisions so for me whatever subject is showing you how to think carefully and logically in consistency about decisions how to process decisions how to make good decisions using the financial frameworks mm. and consider the, the non-financial layers that are critical, for example, um, impact on people. So almost the, 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 you talk about EQ, but the soft skill layers that are now adding more and more value in the modern world, you know, right. yeah. um, in the intangibles that we, we never used to care about. Make that yeah. guy work. Now it's like, how does he work? How does he feel? Those are important things. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. for me, it's to consider these layers simultaneously to be able to process that information, but not be, not be the expert on the detail and the information, but know enough to go and find yeah. the appropriate information to support that. Right. Right. For me, that skill, right, is the, the is almost like the flagship skill that everything else holds on to. Mm. The rest is the color that gives you the, the breadth of thinking to help you touch on more domains in the business world. Mm. So if you don't get that 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 framework right in the beginning, the rest is just meaningless information hanging on nothing. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing that I would say is that any process that for, and, and that causes the collision or the integration of ideas, the okay. fringe where these things come together where, is where the value is created. Mm. The CA that does really well is, is the CA that understands how the financial impact of using this technology, the financial impact on right. hiring that staff. Right. So it's the, it's the blending of the skills and the margins where these, where these competencies come together, mm. where the modern value is added, it's not on the thing itself. So a classic business is like, 
I have a CEO and then I have operations. I have HR, I have IT, I have all these domains Yeah. and they all must run their domain and support each other. Yes. Modern business goes, how do these domains touch each other? Yeah. Because it's the touching of those domains right. that creates the real value of the future. Yeah. Yeah. The whole is greater we, than the sum of the parts. Yeah. How As we, how we um, teach that yeah. to define your success. Going yeah. forward. Okay. That, that's a very roundabout way of trying to answer your question. No, but I think it's good. And it, it's, a, it's a weird question. I mean, but, but the point is just what would you add or how would you shift? Mm. Or like, what would you like to inject into that? That kind of isn't either, as you say, isn't there or is not, quite done in the right way or whatever the case is like it's, it's just a, it's an interesting point and I think you know you, you spoke earlier about the fact that there's a you know it's a two-way street we need we need students to think about this stuff but we also have to have these kind of conversations mm. to to start the thought process because way too many students are kind of locked in exactly as you say um I need to pass you know I need to pass this yeah. thing and that I've just, yeah, overall, overall thank you for all your grand stories etc yeah, but like how's bells dude I need this piece of paper kind of thing and I like, totally understand that but um you know just to have these discussions and kind of go okay good point <laughs> just yeah, to inject like, that little thought process of going oh that's something to think about like you know scratch away at the back of your brain so that's why I think these conversations are so valuable because for someone who may not be getting a lecturer standing in front of them, opening these doors for them. Where do you get this type of information? Like where does No, yeah, no, it's not. And, and, and I would argue that, that unfortunately, when you put pressure on any system, education, yeah. education is a difficult one because education requires time. It requires mulling. It requires reflection. It requires connecting ideas. The minute you put pressure on an educational journey, whether it's the teacher, whether it's the student, you start stripping out the, the layers of the value because those right. are the things that are hard. And yeah. you start just getting to the functional and yeah. the functional is not valuable, valuable. Yeah. So any, I would argue, and I say this fairly about all the institutions around you and I, I don't have any particular one I'm blaming or, but I'm saying that the strain they're under yeah. because of the political climate, financial climate, et cetera, is, is Pushing putting people. pressure yeah. on their ability to deliver on the mandate. They all know, they know what they need to do, but they cannot do it because they do not have the headspace to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I think they know that in their hearts. I think the problem is what do we do with that? Like, like how do we own that responsibility? I, I totally I agree with you. Yeah. I think, you know, the, if you in look a way, at, yeah, sorry. No, 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 I, logistically, yeah. uh, you know, we're still not looking at the majority, majority of the population having access to, you know, to, to the internet, for example doesn't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an indirect problem, but it's a huge issue considering that most, you know, most of your CAs are being trained through, through UNISA, which is distance learning, which means that you, they're still studying on pieces of paper. You know, there's still a significant portion of the population that's studying from a piece of paper. At least, you know, people that have access to, to the internet are able to go, okay, we'll get additional service providers or, we're, you know, we'll go to lectures, whatever the case is. But that, that's still blocking off a massive and increasingly like, huge part of the informational world that's out there that they need to learn to navigate and they're going to be a part of. And so, you know, I, I agree the institutions and, and Psycho, for example, is under huge pressure and going, you know, on the one hand, these guys need this in order, you know, to, to meet these higher needs. And on the other hand, we still need to get a piece of paper to this guy through the post <laughs> because that's all that they've got. So, yeah. you know, how do you well, balance that out? It's very tricky. Well, I, think, I mean, there's hope. Um, I would say it this way. Um, Firstly, you see, I think 10 years ago, we went through this journey ourselves of trying to figure out how to do our program right. online. Yeah. yeah. And we, we, we investigated delivery of almost similar solutions to what we're doing now. Yeah. Um, not as good as what we're doing now, ironically. And at the time, we, we had to, we, we spoke to DSTV about broadcasting through right. DSTV, free channels. Yeah. We spoke to um, uh, internet service providers to show us how we can you know, create the bandwidth necessary to do yeah. the type of meetings and hostings yeah. that we want to do for the good education that we wanted. And the costs were unbelievable. We're talking about maybe our, for our business was going to cost maybe one and a half million a year. Yeah. We went through a very similar process. So I, I feel you. Like, <laughs> what's, exactly. that, yeah. There's no one that can only pay for that. But, yeah. But 10 years later, it's so different, right? It's, well, I yeah. now, I now I'm delivering to, you know, we hosted a live session. Uh, yeah. I hosted one last night, a live session with my students. Okay? Yeah. 220 people seamlessly joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you did that from like people. your house, I was like, when right? does this thing fail, right? Yeah. You know what the beauty, you know what the beauty is? And, and, and this is what people don't realize. And this is what we're learning for the first time because we're in the world now. Yeah. The education is better than life. 
people yes. imply they feel like it's yeah. worse, but it's better because I tell yeah. you what. Imagine there's there's not there's multiple trains of conversation. So okay, I couldn't run it by myself. I had to. Have no, you need academic. a producer. Yes, I know. <laughs> I've done. And that. I've got yeah, an yeah. academic engaging um, WhatsApp yeah. chat. Filtering like, through yeah. the questions and the chats, yeah, yeah. responding the to particular yeah. queries, feedback. So now we've got this like organic learning environment. Fascinating. Yeah, it's awesome. Because it's two hundred students, on average, we find about ten percent of the class actually engages. The others are yeah. observers. We call them okay. lurkers, internet workers. Yeah, you lurkers. call them lurkers. I call them observers. I think no, 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 not we call them. <laughs> Technically, like internet-wise, terminology, education-wise, right, they're right. called lurkers. I think it's right. a fascinating term. I was like, I wouldn't use that term in our world. I think we'd get into trouble. <laughs> I, I see them as observers, okay? And, and right. so between students engaging, now you've got 200 students. Now I've got a class, essentially, of 20 highly engaged people. Yeah. So it seems like, oh, 200 people, how is this going to work? But because no one is like sitting in the back can't see, yeah, right? So we're not disillusioned, yeah. disservicing yeah. everybody. Everyone's getting the same experience. 20 of them are highly engaged. And the other 180 are benefiting off the 20s engagement. Perfect. Perfect. And so now suddenly I've got this robust class. For the yeah. first time, it's been fundamentally more robust. Yeah. And I'm like, this you. is amazing. amazing. And now I can go check this out and I can drop a link in. Check yeah. this out and I can, I can um, show a video yeah. of an example of an idea to, ex yeah. to expand yeah. on the fly. On the fly. You know. And it's, you know, and I don't know if you do it, but, you know, do the live session, record it, and yeah, put, it exactly. up, put it up later. So, yeah, yeah exactly. crap tons of information in one session, but you're there, and once you've gone through it, you can go back to exactly. it again. Exactly. And, you know, you can, you can reassess it, you can go through it in your own time. So, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, from, you know, from, like, a, I do everything completely on my own, and I'm sitting in a little village in Montenegro. Yeah, exactly. know, most of my students are in, in South Africa. I don't have... You know, when we also, when we first started looking into the online stuff, you, you had to have a fancy, very expensive platform. You know, the LMS was very expensive. No, no, no. Now I use like, you know, like a $30. Well, I have, I have, I have pajama <laughs> pants on right now. <laughs> I call it, um, I call it the mullet of the, of the new profession. It's like, you know, party, party, <laughs> yeah, the front, party the back. Really it's like the mullet because you're just very fancy on the top and then. Pajamas on the bottom. Been there, done that. We know that. Okay, I know you're you're heading towards load shedding because you're in South Africa and that's fantastic. So well done, you. Thank you very very much for your time. Um, I definitely would like to carry on this conversation and hopefully yeah, we'll sure. pick up some more questions and relevant stuff from students and comments etc. That um, that they'd like us to cover. But I think it's a topic and a, a you know a bunch of conversations from how we see learning, how students see learning, to the future of the accounts and profession. One of the things we did you know we we did want to discuss is like you know, the societal ethical situation around profession as well. Definitely something, definitely topical. So uh, I really appreciate your time. Look yeah, forward sure. to, to more discussions. Oh, John the pants. <laughs> 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 My, maybe minus the cats next time. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, my dog didn't come in the picture. Yeah, it's your cat. It's the it's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's one of six, by the way. But they, they have no manners. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take it from South Africa? Oh, hell, no. No, Montenegro's got a very big stray, stray animal problem and they kind of adopt And you it. seem to have a very big stray animal problem. We do because we've got very soft hearts and we're like, oh, shame, poor babies. They were like, eyes are falling out and stuff. So they were the runt of the litter and they were dying on the side of the street. So what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> so we have six cats. <laughs> oh, you know, this is how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh You're going to be the cat lady soon. Oh, we are. At least I'm married. That I said, at least I've yeah, uh, I looked at the cats after I was awkward. married. It would be a very awkward conversation if you weren't married. Yeah, otherwise, I would never get married. <laughs> like, oh, you have six cats. Okay, cheers. It's been real. Like, I'm saying that. All right. Anyway, so again, thank you very, very much for your time. Yeah, sure. uh, I appreciate it loads. Um, if there are any links to any articles, websites, topics, books that you you know, you normally look to or you send your students to or you'd like students to take a look at in the context of this discussion, please can you send them through to me and then I'll add mm -hmm. them to the videos, I'll add them to, to the blog post and so students can take a little bit more of a look for themselves and read and explore some further stuff of your discussion as well. So thank yeah. you very much for your time. Pleasure. Enjoy the Good rest luck. of your afternoon. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Cool. Bye. -bye.